Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Come on, give those girls a hand. That was beautiful. <laughs> Absolutely beautiful. Oh, just hold on. Those are great girls. We love it. Thank you. Thank you so much today. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, as we try to give some updates this morning, uh, before we jump into the message, uh, most of you know that the attack on Israel has already begun with Iran uh, itself attacking Israel as well as Hezbollah from Lebanon. Now, the biggest and most aggressive attack has not hit yet. They're saying tomorrow, possibly. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't know. All I know is that what has begun will not end until it moves us into the coming of the Lord, basically. Uh, for those of you who have gotten sort of tired of me talking about the coming of the Lord or think I'm, I, you know, just stuck on it, let me assure you I am. And that uh, what is happening, I am just stunned and amazed at it. And I want you to understand exactly what's happening. Thank God America is sending all kind of new, uh, I mean, sh more ships are going in, planes are going in. Uh, one of our actually leaders of the military all kinds of things are actually going that way, and I praise God in the spirit realm that that is happening. At the same time, it means more and more that America is being drawn into this war. You cannot overlook that side of it. Uh, we are uh, a part of NATO, and uh, whatever, if we are drawn in, which is, uh, Rand says we will be because... Uh, they are threatening, if we do anything to help Israel, that, that they, they will attack every base that we have in the Middle East, and they're not joking this go-round, because they see this as a time not only as the weakness of our nation, but they see it as a time for them to totally do what they have been saying they're going to do since 1948, and that is to bring total destruction to the nation of Israel. Uh, you would do yourself uh, a great favor if you would just stay abreast of what is happening. And again, I do my best to tell you and can tell you far more, I'm sure, on Mondays and Thursdays. But uh, what is happening is unbelievable as you and I watch the end of days. And if you don't interpret it in light of the end of days, you're going to miss so much because it's going to happen so fast that you're going to miss so much of what already is taking place. Let me help you a little bit by understanding that we've said for a long time that the nations that are listed, and it's not, we need to just talk about it in terms of nations that are listed in Ezekiel 38, instead of acting as if I did for years and other people did for years, that there was an Ezekiel 38 war unto itself. That is not so. It's simply the nations that are involved in Ezekiel 38. They have been lined up on the outside. They're no longer on the outside. All the nations, all of them, that uh, are listed in Ezekiel 38 that brings on that moving into that end time war now is very, very active in what is happening in the Middle East. And all of them have basically made it known that they want to totally do away with the nation of Israel. And so all of that brings things to a different light. It brings it to a different light in, in regards to where America is and where it may put us in the next days, hours, who knows, uh, as the things progress very quickly quickly in the Middle East. I just don't want us to be ignorant and caught off guard. I've tried to tell you these things. And remember, all the nations in Ezekiel 38, Ezekiel 38 is a lining up of the nations that you will see working in the book of Revelation. As you remember, the, in the book of Revelation, you, you end up, you know, with uh, seals and trumpets and bowls, simply meaning the degree of that things happen. 
as we find ourselves in uh, Revelation chapter 6 that we've talked about so much, where it's listed as famine and, and uh, war and, and death uh, and, and, and the Antichrist, who, of course, is on the earth, who is, will be revealed very quickly. We will not be here to know to, for that unveil unveiling of who he is. It's a sign for us, but he is here and ready to be appointed. And uh, we are, uh, for whatever reason, God appointed and anointed us. We are here for these end days. We did not choose the, to be here. God put us here for the end days and see the culmination of the age. So as you see things progressing, you need to understand that we are now so far along and, and the church world on a whole is absolutely ignorant to what is going on, don't want to know, many people don't want to know, many people will not even come to church simply because uh, I, I, uh, some even who are part of this church won't come, they don't want to hear any more about it. Well, not wanting to hear it doesn't stop it, nor does it change what is taking place, and God wants us all prepared and, and, and ready for these end days. And, and we serve a magnificent, marvelous God. But again, I want to thank God that we are sending uh, a great deal of help to Israel. I mean, uh, yesterday, today, uh, more than we have ever actually supplied is there. And, but it is wonderful, thank God. But again, it pulls us into the war. And uh, uh, it's... It's bigger than any of us can possibly understand and do not think, well, that's over there and we're over here. No, no, you're going to be caught so off guard. No, I'm afraid that's not the way it happens. And uh, remember again that uh, Russia, as well as China, but particularly Russia, <coughs> is supplying many, many of the weapons that, <coughs> excuse me, that Iran is using. And that uh, uh, along with other countries that are uh, supplying, but and also remember that all countries, uh, uh, if you begin to think that Iran does not have nuclear weapons, you are totally deceived. They have had nuclear weapons for quite a while. And they certainly have missiles with nuclear tips on them are strategic missiles. And... Uh, so we just need to pray that no one uses them because Israel, of course, has them. But Israel is fighting for its survival. And uh, in both countries, uh, the tactical missiles are on the table. And so we pray to God it doesn't come to that. But I would, I would be absolutely not fulfilling my uh, job uh, if I did not keep you abreast of truth and tell you exactly where we are. And it's very exciting, very thrilling, very scary. And uh, that's why we need to pray. We need to pray and understand how to pray. And that's how the Lord leads us on Mondays and Thursdays. And we are thankful to God for that. And because God is going to look after us, he has, and I praise him for it. Uh, you do know that the, uh, Fort Eisenhower is the communication center basically for America. And uh, we have the only reason that if that does not get attacked would be because God has included it in our bubble. And we praise God for that. Don't be ignorant of where we are and the times that we are living in. So having said that... <coughs> The message this morning is an unusual message. <laughs> How many times have I said that lately? <laughs> <clears throat> but it's, you have to listen really well because I'm coming at things a little different and point, you know, everything has two sides. And I've spent 38 years talking about on the healing ministry and everything, talking about one side. And so today, I want to incorporate one side and add another so that we see clearly. 
uh, and understand who God really is. So we're going to talk about God is good all the time. I trust that this will bring great freedom to many people, and it will help you as it has helped me. It, it took me a good bit of time. The Lord had to do a lot of talking to me uh, took a, for, for me to process it and to understand what he's trying to say to us at the, this time and season. So I want you to really, really listen. Again, it's a very freeing message in one sense of the word. Title again. God is good all the time. So from the earliest pages of Scripture to the last word of Revelation, time and time again, we encounter the goodness of God. It begins in Genesis when God spoke the universe into existence, then created Adam and Eve and supplied them, and don't overlook this, and supplied them with everything they would ever need. It was totally given to them, and yet they were deceived anyway, thinking there was something else they needed. Uh, we see his goodness, God's goodness, in his provision of a ram for Abraham as a substitute for Isaac. God's intervention was not only evident of his goodness and mercy, but also of the integrity of God. By, pro by providing the ram, at just the right moment, God showcased his ability to meet our needs in ways that you and I may have never, ever imagined. We find ourselves over and over again in situations that only God can help. Israel is in that place, and America, I'm afraid, is going to end up being in that place. I am assured that God is going to protect and look after the nation of Israel. We learn from the experience of Joseph, that God manifests his goodness even in the midst of betrayal and adversity. God's goodness is not always immediately apparent, you and I know that, but by faith we know we can depend on the goodness of God, even if you don't see it immediately. Looking back, we see so many things of where God was there, helped us through things, showed up if we will have be uh, uh, open enough to see how God moves in our lives. God's goodness also shines brightly in the story of Ruth and Boaz as God uh, turned sorrow into joy in the most unlikely circumstances and to bring about the story and redemption. The story of David's forgiveness after committing adultery with Bathsheba is a powerful example of God's goodness again. If God did it for all of these that I'm naming. God will do it for us. It shines through even in moments of moral failure for all who seek his forgiveness. We're talking about the goodness of God at all times. Even as we look back over the failures of our lives, we look back over things where we have made uh, many mistakes and and done things that we wish to God we had not done. Looking back, you can see God's hand not making us do it, not pushing us that way, but always pulling us to his breast to help us and pull us out of the hole we find ourselves in. There are so many more examples that we could go to in all honesty that relate to this outstanding truth because God's goodness knows no bounds. His goodness is without limit, and I praise him for that with everything in me. As he did for the widow in Elijah's day, he is just as able today to provide our needs abundantly as you and I learn to trust him wholeheartedly. I said learn to trust him wholeheartedly. And surely the story of the prodigal son is a profound example of God's goodness and God's unconditional love that all of us can grab hold of and all of us see God in the midst of everything turning, always turning, always turning things to help us and lead us in directions. Perhaps, though, the most incredible example of God's goodness in the New Testament is the conversion of Paul 
and his subsequent ministry, proving that God can transform the most unlikely of individuals into powerful instruments for his kingdom. And the man that you and I call Paul, who was Saul of Tarsus, is an unbelievable story as you and I take time to read it and look at it. He was the leading prosecutor of the infant church, and he became the prophetic, prolific writer of the New Testament. And it is one of his letters that we are going to look at this morning as we go to 2 Corinthians 12 this morning. I know a man in Christ, is Paul talking, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or out of the body I do not know, God knows. Such a man was called up to the third heaven. And I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body I do not know, God knows, was called up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. On behalf of such a man, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except in regard to my weaknesses. For if I do wish to boast, I will not be foolish, for I will be speaking the truth, but I refrain from this so that no one will credit me with more than he sees in me or hears from me. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions and difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Wow. Wow. Those are profound words, and certainly they are a challenge, I think, to everybody sitting in this auditorium this morning. They are, they need, that said, we need some guidance and insight of the Holy Spirit to draw us into the unique significance of this passage so that we can really see it and understand it. I told the Lord, I said, I've preached on this, <laughs> and, and you have taught me things. He said, yes, let's look at it from a, another angle. I thought, I don't know if I want to. Hallelujah. <laughs> so as he says, you know, let's draw us t that we need the help of God as we look at this particular passage. So let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for what you did in the life of Saul of Tarsus, whom we know, whom we call Paul. His writings and his experiences overflow with information and, informa and inspiration each of us needs as we seek to be sincere and devoted disciples of yours. We ask for the ministry of your Holy Spirit to invade our minds and hearts this morning and to grant us revelation into your word that we might walk in it faithfully. We ask it in the wonderful, powerful, and precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Paul is a singularly unique man whose life and experiences most of us will never fully comprehend until we actually get to heaven. You do know when we get to heaven, we're going to be in school. 
we're going to be learning, hallelujah. Because remember, time we get there, we won't be there long. We'll just be there for a supper and for uh, a gathering at the Bema seat. Then we come back uh, to help rule for a thousand years with Jesus. So there's much we need to know and understand. So let me say this to you. Paul was responsible, as you know, for the death of the first martyr in the early church, who was Stephen. He didn't personally kill Stephen, but he incited the riot and held the garments of those who did stone Stephen. He sought out Christians to persecute them all over the area and to take them in chains as slaves to Rome. But one day he himself, as he traveled on the road to Damascus, Paul was confronted by the Lord himself who asked him, why are you persecuting me? Struck blind, then filled with the Holy Spirit, given amazing revelations, subsequently rejected by the Jerusalem community, Paul then went home to Tarsus for 14 years, went up to the mountains to be with God. And he was there for 14 years before Barnabas went looking for him and brought him to Antioch. From Antioch, if you remember, Paul became the first great missionary to the Gentile world, planting churches everywhere he went, writing most of the New Testament in the form of letters that he sent to each church. And that's what we read in the New Testament. All, most of those books, as I say, were written by this man, Paul. He witnessed signs and wonders, was bitten by a snake, whose poison had absolutely no effect on him. He was rescued uh, five different times, actually, uh, from shipwreck, was stoned, was left for dead, but crawled back into the same town and kept right on preaching. I think most of us would crawled out of town. <laughs> His was a life of huge ups and downs, of miracles, of signs and wonders, and to be absolutely honest, he himself was an outstanding sign and wonder. But what does it say here? What does he say in Second Corinthians? He says, if I'm going to glory at all, I'm going to glory in my infirmities. I'm going to glory in my weaknesses, in my ailments, in my imperfections, my weakness in health, my weakness in body. Let's not forget that Paul, all the beatings that he had, he was beaten many times, actually, 39 lashes on his back several times. Three times he was beaten with rods. And this man, who was, by the way, an outstanding Pharisee of Pharisees, as he described himself. Comes from a wealthy family, coming from a highly respected family of Pharisees. And he was highly respected in the community. I'm sure one day, had he kept right on going there, they would want to some way, somehow, make him high priest if the Lord would allow such. He was of that quality and had all of that going for him. But he says, if I'm going to glory, if I'm going to talk about anything, I'm going to glory in my infirmities. Remember on several different occasions, it says that he was cold. He says that he had no food. He said he was hungry. We know that he was sick upon occasion. We know that he left his friend who was sick, and healing did not come to that friend. It's an amazing story of Paul and learning about the goodness of God. 
Paul acknowledges that he had some kind of thorn in the flesh. I've done a complete teaching on the thorn in the flesh. And what in the world does that mean? People have tried to explain it for 2,000 years. And I said, Lord, I know what it means. <laughs> he said, oh, yeah. You do. You know one side. In one of his letters, he refers to his eyes. So Bible commentators assume that Paul had some kind of visual problem, which in all honesty is probably true. He did not have eyes running down on his face and he looked horrible so nobody could look at him and, and eyes were just all kind of matted stuff. No. If he had some kind of an eye problem, if he did, it was like an eye disease that many people get. Many people in this auditorium may have some eye disease and you wouldn't even know it unless they told you. At another time, he said he was in great trembling and shaking. So another Bible commentator decided that he must have had malaria. And then another commentary said that he probably had epilepsy. The honest truth is we don't know exactly what he suffered with. What matters is what he said next with reference to the thorn in the flesh. Now, it does say very clearly uh, as, he, as he talks about the thorn in the flesh, it, it does say a, a spirit sent to buffet him. It does say that. We don't throw that out and we don't throw that away as if that uh, buffeting of a demonic force was not there in his life causing many problems for Paul. Matter of fact, I can take you back and walk you through the scriptures to show there's a great truth in that. But at the same time, there are many things that appear to say that he had a physical uh, disease of some sort, if we call it ailment of some sort. And the Bible even relates to that. And you can take it and, and make it come forth. But in Second Corinthians, he says, talking about the thorn in the flesh, he says, Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And in other words, you know, I'm saying, Lord, get this off of me. Lord, take this away from me. Lord, get this out of my life and remove it. Now, I don't think that that means that he asked the Lord to deliver him three mornings in a row or three evenings in a row. I think it's over a period of time that he asked the Lord, you know, could you please handle this for me? Now, it's more likely that he asked the Lord to heal his eyes on three separate occasions. Maybe he even fasted about it. Again, I come to say that something probably ailed his eyes based on, he said, see, I wrote this with my own hands, saying that many times he would have someone that would, such as Luke or whomever, that would take his dictations and write them down. He acknowledged that himself, that that happened. Again, we're not talking like some people have made some kind of creepy thing. You couldn't even look at Paul. That's stupid. We're not talking about that. This is Paul now that we're talking about. That guy knew how to get hold of the Lord. And let's be really honest this morning. No matter how smart we may think we are, no matter how great we think we know everything, I'll assure you Paul knew how to get in touch with God. Amen. I'll assure you he knew how to pray. I guarantee you more than, better than any of us in here. He knew how to pray, how to get hold of God, and I'll assure you he knew how to intercede, and I guarantee you he knew how to present his case to God. I guarantee you that. Better, I would say, than most of us. Whatever his thorn in the flesh was, that's not the point. That's not even the issue. Paul asked the Lord three times to get rid of it. 
whatever it was. I do believe that no matter disease or whatever it was, it's demonic. It was a thorn. It was slowing him up. It was aggravating, irritating. You got to remember he doesn't live in our season where they're the medical profession is such as it is today. You've got to remember all those things. Knowing a little bit about the character of Paul, I can envision Paul saying, Now, Lord, this problem is really a nuisance. It slows me down. It hinders my ministry. I'm seriously asking you to remove it, whatever it was. I could serve you much better if I didn't have to deal with this thing. I'll assure you, as you read about Paul, that Paul was that kind of a bold man. And he would have come to God boldly and would have brought this to him, whatever hardship it may have been, handicap. But he asked three times. Paul got an answer from the Lord. God Almighty answered him. But it was not the one he wanted. I think that's what we're trying to learn today. <laughs> God said, no, I'm not lifting this off of you, but I will give you this. I'll give you enough grace because my grace is going to be sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weaknesses. I don't like that answer any more than you do. When I come to God asking him things, like Paul has asked, and he says, you know, we got this. We meaning me and him have got it, and meaning that he will give me enough grace to deal with whatever is happening. And I know that I've said, really, Lord, is that your answer? I'm sure Paul said, are you teasing me? Paul's challenge, church, is our challenge today. When we give in to fear and the days in front of us, the days we're going to face, the days of where we are, when we give in to fear, doubt, insecurity, and uncertainty, the enemy begins, the enemy begins to lie to us, making us think that God is up in heaven playing with his butterflies instead of working on our own personal problems and helping us. And maybe we didn't think he was playing with butterflies. We thought he was just up there paying no attention to us, whatever it might be. Or some may think that maybe my name has slipped his mind and he's too busy with other folks in order to deal with my particular situation. Do I have your attention? Do I have your attention today? Yes. Are you listening? Yes. Well, even based on what I've said thus far, you can understand. I said, what? I'm a faith teacher. <laughs> I'm a healing teacher. 38 years of it. He said, yes, and what you did was exactly what I wanted you to do, and it was correct. But, but, however, let's now be mature enough to look at a whole picture and see it because it will help so many people. When we think that God's too busy, that he's forgotten our name, that's when we need to get a grip and declare, and God said, do it out loud. My God knows my name, and he loves me and cares for me. Let's do it together. My God knows my name, and he loves me, and he cares for me. Let's say it again. My God knows my name, and he knows me. Yeah, yes, he loves me, and he cares for me. Let's do it one more time. My God knows my name, and he loves me, and he cares for me. Now, if you have to say it a hundred times for it to get a hold of you, then say it because words have power. Mark eleven twenty three. 
For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. I mean, it's Jesus who said that. And no one has more greater authority than Jesus. He said it. He also said, <laughs> however, he also said, <laughs> Matthew 12, for by your words you will be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. Not by your emotions, not by your feelings, but by your words. It matters what you say yes. with your mouth. So what was Paul's reaction again when God said no to the request that Paul had of him? Second Corinthians 12 tells us again, and he said to him, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. 12.9. Did I read it? Okay. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. So in this statement is an acknowledgment that Paul himself had to come to grips with the principle he wrote about in his letter to the Romans, Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. You see, church, our problem is that when we talk about the goodness of God, sang about it this morning, wonderful, thank you so much. When we talk about the goodness of God, we want him to be good the way we want him to be good. We want it immediately, and we want it to be absolutely in agreement with our wants and our desires. Now, if there's anybody in here who doesn't agree with that statement, I think we need to deal with you because you're not telling the truth. We want God to do what we want God to do. And in case he doesn't know how to do it, we're going to tell him we've worked out a plan. And for him to go ahead doing whatever, but just implement our plan. He doesn't have to figure it out. We've got it figured out for him. Just make it work. That's really what we say. Now, we may not express it, but that's what we think, and that's what we want. We want God to be the one who answers all of our prayers all the time and to do it, to do it according to our preconceived ideas of what we think God ought to do. Come on, stay with me. We want him to answer us, as I said, the way we've decided he should answer us because we've read his book and this is how we know he should do it. Sometimes, though, we only read certain portions and then we take it and make it fit. You know, as good as I do, that you can take a scripture and you can say anything you want to. Go hang yourself, you know, go do likewise. I mean, you can, you know, you, you, you can make, you can say most anything if you don't keep it together, if you don't stay with the principle of what's being taught and being said at that time. After all, since we want God to do it our way and our season and our time, isn't that what the Internet tells you? <laughs> Meaning... How many videos has anybody looked at that tell you how to get what you want from God? They're all over the place. Now, hear what I said, how to get what you want from God. How to get what you want from God. Name it, claim it. All of those videos that say things like that seem to imply 
that our Heavenly Father is at our service 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In other words, he jumps when we snap our finger. He really jumps if we memorize the scriptures. <laughs> he really jumps if we know how to say it boldly. That's not how it works. We are to be at his service 24 hours a day, Amen. seven days a week. Now, let me be very clear. Our Heavenly Father loves us. He cares for us. He watches over us. He provides for us. Sent Jesus to us. Works miracles. Solves our problems. And has created a heavenly realm for us to be with him forever. But he is not Santa Claus. If we aren't careful... We don't call him Santa Claus, but we think he might be kind of like Santa Claus. God is not in the business of pampering us and spoiling us. Oh, I've had many a conversation about this message since I just got it the other day. I said, really? It's one of those that I said again, and you want me? to preach this? Moi? Do you know what I've preached on? <laughs> Have you not read and listened to my messages? <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on, put a smile on your face. You're going to learn some depth about God. That's going to make him even greater to you. He's not in the business of pampering us, spoiling us. He's the almighty, eternal one, and he's also our father who teaches us, trains us, and corrects us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's why he's good. It's his goodness that prepared every detail of your life and mine with an eye to transforming us into the image and likeness of his beloved son. That's the Father's plan. Amen. Wherever, no matter how you have made mistakes and gotten yourself in all kinds of situations, when God in his mercy and grace gets you out of them or helps you to survive in them, all of it, all of it, is that when he released you from heaven, released me from heaven, and we came in spirit form, let me remind you, God is concerned about your spirit man. Yes. Your body is here to carry you while you are here. This body does not go to heaven. You get a new body. For some of us, we want to shout. <laughs> but we get a new body that will be like him. This body, the body you have, will not go to heaven. It will go back to the earth from whence it came. I don't care if you jack it up, tie it up, pump it up, <laughs> whatever you want to do to it. You can do whatever way down here trying to make it last as long as you can. <laughs> we don't try to make it last. We try to make us look better while we're hanging on. <laughs> but the truth is, you would be amazed at how many people think that this body will be resurrected at the end and that this body is the one that goes to heaven. No it does not. Hallelujah. And so the Father's plan, he deals with your spirit man who is traveling around in your body, which is a carriage for your spirit man. It's a house where you, your spirit, you are not body, you are spirit. 
your body is an expression of a way for us to identify you, but it is not who you are. You know these things. Spirit, soul, and body. It is the soul area that gives us the difficulty. It's the soul area that confuses us because we don't renew our mind. We don't change our thinking in alignment with God. We begin to think what the world says. And God does not deal with what the world says. So he sent you from heaven as a spirit to inhabit the body that was formed in your mother's womb. Whether she wanted you or didn't want you. Whatever. And let me go on. I've addressed it many times. If a child is aborted or whatever, God Almighty, that child goes to heaven. But God, unless you repent, will not forget that you aborted that child. That's why repentance is so important. And when you get to heaven, you will meet that child. Amen. If you've asked for forgiveness for aborting the child, just because you didn't want to put up with it, and because of women's rights, and men don't give a rip, most of them, about aborting a baby. They don't want to have to deal with it. Why can I say that? Look at national statistics. A lot of the problems in homes today is because there's no man in it, no father image. But you came with the Father's intent to make you like him, like Jesus. That's his whole concept, that we become like Jesus. And everything he brings our way is for us to be like Jesus. Now, some of the places we found ourselves in and some of the things have happened, you know, God didn't ordain it things we've done ourselves, but God in his mercy and grace will take whatever and then still pick up the pile of mess we've made and form it to be like his son if we will let him. So the Father's plan always, no matter what's happening, no matter where you are, his plan right now in your life, wherever you may find yourself, He's still working that you, he's not working on your body per se. He's working on you, your spirit man, which he deals with through your soulish area that you will become like him. And the more we become like him, the more it affects the body. It's his goodness, God's goodness, that dispenses abundant grace for us to walk in his ways. It's his goodness that created angels as ministering spirits and sent them to serve you for those who are being saved. Thank God for angels. I believe in angels. I believe in angels. I believe angels are in every single one of your homes. I believe in it. I believe they ride in your car with you. I believe everywhere you go, your guardian angel, you cannot get away from him. And he can only work on your behalf as you're in agreement with the Word of God. So, God is good. God is good. He's a good God. So, the Scriptures tell us to come boldly before the throne of grace. But listen carefully. There's a big difference between coming boldly and coming arrogantly I have to admit there's times I've come arrogantly I'm so glad y'all haven't but I'm willing to take you through deliverance at any moment 
not trying to be arrogant, mm -hmm. but just so caught up and so wrapped up, so, you know. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving me. Amen. There's a big difference between coming in expectant faith and coming in demanding presumption. That one I hope you really got. A big difference between coming in expectant faith, expecting God, and coming in demanding presumption. Believe in miracles, church, and believe in expectant faith because it moves in your life. But don't let yourself be tricked by the enemy into thinking you deserve it or that you've earned it. Amen. We kind of play with that, don't we? The deserving part because of who we are in Christ Jesus. Lord, forgive us. In other words, don't come thinking you deserve it or earned it. So don't join the entitlement generation. Don't ever think, I deserve this God. I'm using the word deserve. I can pray because of who I am. And I can ask. There's a different in asking and hoping than, than it is from thinking I deserve it because of who I am. I don't even deserve to go to heaven. Nor do you. You don't want what you deserve. If we all got what we deserve, everybody in here would be in hell. So how do we maintain the right balance in our understanding of the goodness of God? Yes, make your petitions known to God. Persuaded that he welcomes you and he listens to every word you say to him. This is the key. But do it with a humble faith that knows you can trust him to do what is best, even if it's not comfortable and not what you thought he should do. If we can line up and say, Lord, I want what you think is best for my life because I know that everything in my life you will move me to be more like Jesus. You will take wherever I find myself, whatever's happened in my life, if I come to you humbly, you will use it to bring me to a situation that I will be more like your son. Seek his heart more than you seek his hand. That's what Paul is saying to the Corinthians. You know, there's some things that won't bow if they're critical to your destiny. Wow. Mighty quiet. Wow. If there's things that are around you now that are critical to your destiny because you wouldn't come any other way, are critical to your destiny, there's some things God won't remove. because he's more interested in you being like his son. Lord, help us to understand. Paul wanted the hand of God to move on his behalf, and there's nothing wrong with that. God did not rebuke Paul for saying, please get this thorn out of my flesh. So nothing wrong in asking. God simply said, my grace, Paul, is sufficient. With me, Paul, 
you'll overcome this. With me, you'll handle this. With this, it'll make you like my son. God will bring us the easiest way we will come. He said that to me so many times. I brought you the easiest way you would come. When I've said, oh, dear God, I'm so sorry I went that way or did that or whatever. I was there. I was there. And I've been bringing you to me and bringing you and molding you into the likeness of God, the likeness of my son. I brought you the easiest way you would bow, the easiest way you would ask me, the easiest way that you'd reach out to me, the easiest way you would let me transform you. My grace is sufficient. In other words, I've given you enough grace that you can conquer anything that comes your way. No matter what it is, you will be a conqueror. You will be an overcomer. You don't overcome everything in the flesh. You overcome things in the soul and spirit. My flesh doesn't do right all the time. But if I can get my spirit, man, that I trust God no matter what, and I believe I am growing into the likeness of Jesus. And so are you. Three times Paul asked for deliverance for his infirmity. But what he received instead was something greater. The goodness of God expressed in his sustaining grace. In other words, you will not fall. You're not go backward. My grace will pull you through this. Let me just read this to you. Paul learned that greater than any miracle, greater than any answer to prayer, is the amazing and abundant provision of grace, that unmerited favor from God that undergirds our lives and is indeed sufficient for everything we will face in life. Everything that will ever come your way, I've given you what you need to conquer it, is what he's saying. I'm going to read that to you again. Paul learned that greater than any miracle, greater than any answer to prayer, is the amazing and abundant provision of grace, that unmerited favor from God that undergirds our lives and is indeed sufficient for everything, everything, everything right. we face in life. Perhaps somebody in here is thinking, but pastor, the scripture says that God gives us the desires of our heart. It does say that. It does. However, before we ask for the desires of our heart, don't you think we ought to ask the Lord what his desires are for us? First John 5. This is the confidence we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Okay, the bottom line in this entire message is this. Pray and expect miracles. Persuaded that your God is a good God, that he's powerful, that he's gracious, that he's full of love for you, that he always listens to you, that he's always attentive to you as his child. But also pray in the full knowledge that we don't deserve any miracle of grace that God gives us, Therefore, praise and thanksgiving are always appropriate. Amen. That says, I'm going to praise him anyway. The most difficult position for many spirit-filled disciples to learn is how to maintain the balance 
that on the one hand, our good God is a miracle-working God who responds to the prayer of faith, and on the other hand, he is absolutely right and good when he does not send us what we wanted. Didn't get very many amens on that one. I'll quote it again. The most difficult position for many spirit-filled disciples, Jesus said, is to learn how to maintain the balance that on the one hand, our God is a miracle-working God who responds to the prayer of faith. And on the other hand, He's absolutely right and good when He does not send us what we wanted. Because what we wanted may hinder our destiny. If you're just determined to do it your way, you could miss your destiny yeah. or step out of it. Yeah. So let me remind you of two instances in the New Testament, both in ministry of Jesus. In Matthew 15, Jesus encounters a Syrophoenician woman, as you know, a Gentile, who cries out to him regarding her demon-possessed daughter. The, di the disciples try to shut her up, but she persisted until Jesus himself rebuked her in one of the hardest passages in the Bible to understand. Basically, Jesus says to her, look, I'm the Messiah of the Jews. You're Gentile. I can't take the food out of the children's mouths and feed it to the dogs. That's what he said. That's pretty hard, church. Mm -hmm. The expected response from 99.9% .9 of folks would be, are you calling me a dog? <laughs> well, that tells me you're not the man of God I thought you were. Now, remember, a dog in that day was really just talking about Gentiles. All Gentiles were considered dogs. It just implied that they were inferior to Jews. But interesting enough, her response... Well, amazingly, she said, you're right. right. And I know I'm a dog, but even the dogs are allowed to eat the crumbs that the babies drop. Yes. That was her response. Right. Wow. No one, not one shred of pride, not a single evidence that she took any kind of offense, wow. not even a hint that she thought of walking away angrily. She agreed with him. And how did Jesus respond? Matthew 15. Then Jesus said to her, Oh, woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. Now, at first glance, it doesn't seem like a matter of faith, but of humility. But it's both. There's another similar situation. A Roman centurion, we like to quote this one. A Roman centurion petitions Jesus on behalf of his servant who's dying. You remember. Jesus responds by saying, I'll come to your house. The Gentile centurion immediately replies, I could never ask you to come into my Gentile house. Rabbis don't enter Gentile homes. But if you just say a word, Jesus, I know my servant will be healed. Matthew 8 records it. Now, when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who were following, Truly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. He was a Gentile. He wasn't a Jew. I could not imagine. I preached it many times over many, many places. I cannot imagine. Jesus saying, I'm, I'll come on to your house. Let's go, buddy. And me saying, you don't have to come. It's okay. I would think, you know, I'd be saying, come on. Right. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. Send a runner in front of me. Jesus is coming in my house. Glory to God. <laughs> come on. Let's lock arms. Let's go down the street. Hallelujah. Yeah. 
Can you imagine Jesus, the Christ, saying, I'm coming to your house, and then you turn into him and tell him, don't come? <laughs> and then Jesus said, huh, man, I ain't seen any face like this anywhere in this whole nation of Israel. Wow. As you know, his servant was healed. In both instances, the Lord highlights faith. A faith grounded in humility. It was their humility that empowered their faith in Jesus and what he could do. It was their humility that empowered him to work in their life. It's humility that says, Lord, I'm asking you for a miracle, and if you give me one, I'll praise you forever. But if you say to me, my grace is sufficient, I will still keep praising you because you are good. Now, church, let us praise the miracle worker far more than we praise the miracle. I've seen so many times people praising the miracle and kind of forget about the miracle worker. They get caught up in what God has done for them instead of God being in them and loving them and holding them. So faith without humility quickly becomes arrogant presumption, which always will find fault with God. Our God is a good God who will never ignore your request for a miracle or be annoyed that you ask for one. Remember, God is always dealing with your spirit, man. He is not going to be ignored that you request a miracle. That doesn't upset him. And it doesn't bother him that you ask for it. He will never ignore that you ask him. But there may be a moment when God draws near to you and says, my grace is sufficient for you in this moment. My grace will make you overcome. My grace will transform you to be like my son. My grace will take you higher than the miracle would ever have taken you. Amen. In that moment, God is still good yes. and always will be. He's a good, good God. He's always good. Let's say it. God is good, God is good. All, the all the time. Let's say it again. God, God is good all the time. And let's praise him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Praise you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. If we had time, I could call people up here who it appears that God did not answer their prayer for a miracle. And there are many of you sitting in here that would say, I learned so many things. God taught me so many things. I'm a far better person Amen. because he sustained me with grace. I began to know him better. Many of you would say that to me. That doesn't mean that we stop asking for miracles. Amen. It doesn't mean we quit praying for miracles or that we stop teaching healing. Healing is certainly in this book. Amen. And yes, by his stripes we are healed. But this body, this body, no matter what condition your body is in, your body will not keep you out of heaven. Nor will it put you in heaven. It's the spirit inside of you that responds to God Almighty 
and it can take you to heights unknown that your body can never take you to. It's your spirit man that is so big sometimes your body can hardly hold you. And one day, you're going to burst out. Glory to God. We're going to meet him in the sky. Even when you meet him in the sky, you still burst out of this body. Hello, church. What a God we serve. Amen. Mm -hmm. Won't you stand? Glory to God. I learned a lot. Did you learn anything? Praise his holy name. What a God. Every area, arena of our life, if we will let him, he's intimately involved in it. Always, always using wherever we might be, if we will take hold of his grace, always moving us to be more like him. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Glory to God. God is a wonderful, wonderful God. Thank you. You know, I don't know what's happened just during the time that we've been here in Israel, in America. Stands that's been taken, thanks that's been done. But I know this God's going to look after His church. Yes. And I know this we desperately need to pray. We can pray our covering, we can pray so many things that we've done, as other churches have, a covering that God has put over this place. But we need to have more coverings over our the CSRA. We need to have stronger faith to believe that God is a prayer answering God. And, you know, when we get in unity, we do things that cannot be done any other way. So I, I hope you will pay attention to what's happening and what's going on because God's moving in might and power. I mean, he truly is. I mean, great things are happening right now. It's amazing to think that you and I could be living in the closing of an age, handpicked by God, to see the Bible just come alive in front of you. God bless you. I love you. Thank you. Thank you. Hope to see you tomorrow night. Man, do you mind closing in prayer for us, please? Thank you. Father, thank you for this word today. Father, let us meditate on it. Father, let us get it down deep within us, Lord. You are good. Father, we're here at this time because you chose us to be here for this time. And Father, let us take that responsibility seriously. Lord, let us rise above having to have our own way all the time, Lord. You are good. You are good. Father, we know it, but sometimes it's good to be reminded. You are good. With everything going on around us, Lord, you are good. Father, we speak protection over our, our area, Lord. Father, over our church here lord but father i thank you that that umbrella goes out over each of our homes father over our families lord god protection lord god father we speak peace over the nation of israel lord god in the midst of whatever is going on right at this moment lord we speak peace protection divine intervention from you lord lord we know you're going to take care of them lord i think about children and mothers and 
fathers and brothers and sons, Lord, who are separated due to war, Lord. Father, give them peace. Let them feel your love, Lord God. Draw them to you, Lord. And Father, may this be our finest hour, Lord God. Father, I ask a blessing over everyone within the sound of my voice, Lord God. Father, watch over us as we go home. Father, as we go out to eat, Lord, may somebody see Jesus in us this very day. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>